everyone. Welcome. Good evening for those of you joining us on the East Coast. Good late afternoon for those of you joining us on the West Coast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ethan Marcus, and I am the Director of Communications for La Hermandad Sephardi de America, the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, the national umbrella organization for the Ladino-speaking Sephardic communities of the United States. We're so excited to have you here with us tonight for a very special program, our fifth and final one of this uh, Sephardic Industry Leaders Series with our dear friend, Richard Galanti, the Chief Financial Officer and Executive Vice President of the Costco Wholesale Corporation. Just as a reminder, this wonderful program is through our new Sephardic Digital Academy Initiative, a national online initiative dedicated to uh, supporting the Ladino-speaking Sephardic communities with all types of wonderful educational programming, ranging from Ladino language classes, Sephardic history classes, Sephardic Torah classes, Sephardic cooking classes, of course, and so much more. If you're ent ever interested in learning more about the other programs we're running, please check out our website at SephardicBrotherhood.com slash Sephardic Digital Academy. And just a few words about our guest this evening, Richard Galanti, who again is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer and Director of the Costco Wholesale Corporation. Richard has been a director of the company since January of 1995 and Executive Vice President and CFO of the company since October 1993. He was Senior Vice President, Chief Financial Officer and Treasurer of the company from January 1985 to October 1993, having joined as Vice President Finance in March 1984. From 1978 to February of 1984, Mr. Galanti was associate with Donaldson, Lufkin, and Generic Securities Corporation in New York. Richard, thank you so much for being here. We just need you to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hey, everyone. How are you? Good. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Happy to be here. So we're just going to jump into some questions first off, and then in the second half, if you have any questions to ask us from the audience, please feel free to chat in them into the, to the chat as well. So Richard, maybe you can tell us a little bit first about your background, both your personal background as a support of you and your professional history as well. Sure. Well, I grew up many years ago in Atlanta, Georgia, when it was a smaller city. Uh, I grew up Sephardic. Uh, my family and I attended uh, Congregation or Racial Alum back when it was in the Highlands. And uh, of course, now it's over in North George Hills Road. And, uh, uh, you know, spent, you know, from birth to age 18 through high school there. Uh, attended college up in Philadelphia. Uh, worked summers during college for the family grocery business in, back in Atlanta. And, uh, you know, grew up traditional Jewish, uh, while, you know, had a lot of Sephardic Jewish friends, had a lot of Ashkenazi Jewish friends as well. Uh, back then, the, the Jewish Community Center uh, was uh, a center point for a lot of social activities for Jewish teenagers, uh, both throughout the whole calendar year. Um, went to summer camp at Barney Menitz and, and Camp Blue Star a couple of years. So some of that you could relate if you were back in Atlanta. Uh, after college, I uh, was a finance major, uh, went to Wall Street and worked, as you mentioned, for a firm, uh, Donaldson, Lufkin, and Generette, which is a boutique investment banking firm, now part of a bigger firm called Credit Suisse that acquired DLJ back in the early 90s. Uh, did traditional investment banking activities, help companies raise debt and equity, uh, go public, uh, sell off a division, buy a company, whatever, and spent about two and a half years at DLJ uh, on either side of, of business school. Uh, and uh, it, my last deal I worked on was a, uh, what's referred to in the business as a Series A financing, a private equity offering for a little startup company in Seattle called Costco. And at the time, I had no plans to necessarily leave my job in New York uh, and uh, pursue something else. But as happenstance had it, I worked on a, 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 an interesting financing. Uh, it was a retailer, of course, and I grew up in a family grocery store business with my, all my cousins. And uh, as we were closing the deal and the company Costco was opening its third Costco, uh, the two founders uh, who liked me, I think more because I knew uh, retail a little bit, uh, uh, they were letting their original CFO go and asked if I'd like to come out here and join the company. And I said, what the heck? Uh, you know, if uh, it didn't work out, I could always go back to New York for the third time or perhaps go back to Atlanta or wherever else. And so, uh, you know, I was single, didn't own a house. Didn't own a car actually either in New York. And uh, 
So I moved out here with the thoughts of being here for you know two or three or four years, and then probably moving back to Atlanta, my hometown, and living happily ever after. Now that I screwed that one up. Uh, I've now been at Costco for 36 and a half years. The day I arrived in March of 84, there were uh, four Costcos, and uh, we had an accounting department with 12 people, uh, excluding the controller because he had quit out of frustration two months prior to my arrival. So that was one of my first orders of business. But it was really, uh, most importantly, Costco was founded by a group of 40-something uh, merchants and operators that had come principally from San Diego and a company, a retail company down there called FedMart. And uh, several of these guys had worked together. Uh, Jim Sinegal, our co-founder and really the spirit of our company and my boss for the first 28 years, uh, met a local entrepreneur, Jeff Brotman from Seattle. Jeff wanted to bring this newfangled concept called a warehouse club. There was one of them in San Diego, the first one in the mid seventies called the Price Club and uh, wanted to bring that concept to Seattle. And he was looking for somebody to run it. He met Jim and overnight they said, let's not just, let me not just hire you, let's be partners. And uh, a match was made. Uh, once the original money was raised, uh, friends and family around in 83, um, Jim called several colleagues he had worked with for if you're in the mid forties and then he was working in retail for 20 years. He uh, says, we got the money, come on up. And uh, as good fortune would have it for me, um, later in 83, as Costco was opening its first few locations, the original CFO didn't work out. And uh, as we were closing this second, fin this A financing that I worked on, in, uh, that closed in December of 83, uh, Jeff and Jim said, hey, you want to come out here? And uh, it was great. Uh, you know, I was young, single, I had hair, uh, I weighed a little less, and uh, it was a great opportunity. When people asked me, uh, did I think it was going to become this big, great, successful, wonderful company? Absolutely not. Um, I had no idea what would happen, uh, but I was young and single, and uh, it was a great experience. And again, I've been blessed. The uh, company has not only been successful, but it's uh, highly regarded as a company that takes care of its employees and does things the right way, that's constantly improving and has a you know, reputation for quality. And I get to tell the story uh, from an investor relations standpoint. So today, um, uh, Costco, we just opened three weeks ago our 800th Costco. Uh, we're now in 11 or 12 countries. Um, we actually have an opening as we speak. It's tomorrow morning in Taiwan. I think our 18th location in Taiwan. And, uh, and uh, about 550 of the 800 locations are here in the U.S. And so we've been successful. We brought our concept to other countries successfully. Not every big box retailer in the world can say that. Um, it works everywhere. People like big American stuff at great values along with local stuff. And uh, today, my area's responsibility haven't changed that much since the day I started, although there's a lot more people. As I mentioned, the day I started, I think there were 12 people in accounting, mostly accounts payable clerks, one person that ran all the fax machines, if you know what those are. And uh, today, accounting, uh, our headquarters accounting staff is about 485 people. And there's another 100 accounting people spread between the other countries uh, on a dotted line responsibility basis. Um, there's a treasury function, of course, that manages all the banking relationships and all the cash flows and everything, with about 30 people. There's a, uh, an internal audit function, while technically reports to the outside board of directors, it has a dotted line responsibility to me. And with about 20 people, uh, we have an a small investor relations staff of three or four people that also help with all the budgeting for the company. And uh, the one thing that's unusual outside of those traditional areas of, of the CFO, uh, accounting, finance, treasury, and the like, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, IT, uh, the IT function reports up to me. That's about 2,300 people. Um, always, people always ask, well, why do you have IT? And of course, I'd say it's because nobody else wanted it. The reality is, is that's how it was from the beginning of time here when it was called electronic data processing or EDP. And uh, I'm more of, while well, we have a CIO, as you might expect, the, the chief information officer who's a senior executive who reports up to me. I'm really more of, on the business side of it. But the answer is, is that that's also reports up to me. And that's who we are today. Um, again, we've been, we've done well in this uh, pandemic, but at the end of the day, personally, from a growing up in Atlanta standpoint, from my uh, Jewishness and my Sephardicness, um, uh, I'm certainly a, a proud Jew and a proud Sephard. 
And uh, although I, like my father, I married an Ashkenazi, and I attend, having moved to her hometown, uh, we attend the Ashkenazi synagogue, one of the Ashkenazi synagogues here in town. But I uh, certainly, uh, she grew up with many Sephardic kids because uh, she lived nearby two of the big Sephardic synagogues in town. And uh, certainly we have plenty of friends on both sides of that. Um, but one of the things I recognize is, is that as uh, you go from generation to generation, maintaining that Sephardic connection, <clears throat> it's wonderful and it's so important. And, uh, and that becomes a greater task each generation. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, Ethan. And uh, if you want to talk about, what, which I need to talk a little bit about, I shared a little bit about what I do here at Costco. But feel free to ask me any questions you'd like. Yeah, thank you so much. That was a, that was a great kind of overview. Thank you so much of, of, of really fascinating. You know, it's, it's always so interesting to condense 40 years of a person's life into just a few words. So I think that really summed it up well. I want to get into a little bit uh, first about your, your corporate experience. You know, going from the ground up, you mentioned how you kind of got in many ways in the ground floor, how Costco, when it was a small, small company, all the way to this massive international company. You've seen it progress in a certain way. Can you talk a little about um, kind of building those skills along the way in terms of managing just a few people to now 2,300 people, as you mentioned, kind of what that looks like over time? And, and also, what does it look like as, a, as an individual as you kind of grow your, your responsibilities? You also kind of grow your experience in kind of a very broad corporate manner. Sure. Um, well, first of all, you know, I always say that I remember years ago, uh, Jim Senegal, my boss for those first 28 years, uh, he would say time and again, it's easy to hire someone smart, find me somebody that's a good manager. And, um, and now I'm saying that I grew up in a small grocery store environment and did a little bit of managing, not very well necessarily. Um, I remember when I first got here, we had those four, the original four warehouse retail locations. And, uh, and, and again, I mentioned my first order of business was hiring a, uh, a, a new controller who was coming in as a vice president of the company. And, uh, and when we were hiring him and I went to Jim to say, this is what I want to offer him. He looked up at me, he says, that's more than the three warehouse men or the four warehouse managers make. And I'm thinking to myself, my fly, this is the VP and controller of our whole company. And he says, he's every bit as good as our four managers, you know, pay him this, this similar amount. And I kind of walked away going, you gotta be kidding me. And over the years, I've recognized how important it is, the ability to manage and teach. And uh, I've gone probably from a D minus to a B, a solid B maybe. But at the end of the day, I'm always amazed at a, man at a manager's ability. And you know, part of growing is hiring good people uh, around you and below you uh, that can do. Jim used to always say to all of us, if he could do every job at this company, uh, there'd be one employee, him, but he can't. And manager's job is, is not to necessarily do, they can do, uh, I think a manager out in the warehouse, if they need to run a register, fine, but their, their job is to teach and to, to develop managers so you can leverage all the, the, the needs and capabilities of the company. Um, yeah, I, I think over time, um, it's unusual, I know it's unusual for someone particularly as young as I was at the time, continue to grow and, and hopefully grow successfully with the company as it's gone from, you know, I think I was about the 40th person, 50th person in the central office to now about 8,000 people here and another 3,000 worldwide in regional administrative offices and country offices. Um, you know, we have grown up and I've grown up and, uh, you know, you, you rely on outside uh, capabilities as well, whether it's your outside legal firms hiring the right people, uh, certainly today being a big company and a public company and a company that deals with all types of food and safety and private uh, pharmacies with privacy. Uh, there's all kinds of things you got to deal with today. And, and certainly uh, from a 40,000 foot level, I think I, uh, I understand it all, uh, but I recognize and we as a company recognize that over time you've got to bring people into those roles. And so, you know, uh, I, I, I'm proud of the people that uh, I'm proud of my departments that they've grown and been successful. Um, I'm, I'm always happy to hire somebody smarter and more capable than me. And, uh, and I think we've got a great group of people. And I think part of my job also, and you know, I, I, I think I look back sometimes at other big multinational companies. There's probably a bunch of companies I would not have fit in as well as I do here. 
This is a company that's a pretty down-to-earth company that goes by uh, our first name, as you can see on my badge, uh, uh, where we give out assigned parking lots for the 8,000 parking spaces for the 8,000 people based on when you started, not when you what position you are at the company. Now recognize I get a good space either way, but at the end of the day, uh, the the basic tenants and attributes of Costco. Uh, what it started with at the beginning of time in terms of taking care of your employees, making them feel safe and secure, being transparent, dealing with adversity head on, all, all the basic things that in part, I think I learned in my dad and my uncle's grocery, small grocery business uh, in terms of customer service. Uh, this was a really lucky, good fit for me. Um, and uh, uh, if anything, um, I worked for a, a founder that probably walked on water in some ways that relates to taking the extreme of taking care of the customer and taking care of your employee and, and being tough but fair with your suppliers and your, their partners, not just trying to negotiate the last penny out of something and, uh, and doing what's doing the right thing. Um, you know, uh, we've, as a company, have been blessed. Uh, 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 Warren Buffett's partner, Charlie Munger, who's 96, has been on our board for 25 years. Uh, many years ago, he'd say more than once, um, you know, take the high road. It's a lot less traveled and it's a little harder to do. I mean, so as a company, it's been a fun company that I think I've even improved my basic attributes of taking care of things and, and, and being transparent and learning how to deal with things uh, directly. And uh, so it, it's been a great learning environment for me, but also an environment, I think, that has a personality that was consistent with some of the attributes that I grew up with in, in the family grocery business. Now, I want to touch a little bit about uh, kind of what you alluded to with the growing up in that small kind of tight-knit community, particularly with the grocery business. And you grew up in, in, in Atlanta at Orbis Shalom, one of our affiliate Sephardic synagogues. Can maybe you can talk about a little bit of growing up in what today is now a rarity in some cases, kind of that tight-knit Sephardic Latino-speaking community. Maybe talk a little bit about how that heritage and the kind of that 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 family-oriented environment kind of influenced your corporate outlook or your professional outlook? Sure. Well, I, you know, I look back today and I could consider myself very fortunate. My dad who, and mom were 89 and 88. My dad was the youngest of five children uh, whose parents had immigrated, uh, like many, from, uh, from Turkey and Greece uh, to America, to Atlanta in the, uh, in the early 1920s, I believe. And... Uh, and so they were born and raised there. My dad and his three brothers uh, had four little stores, two grocery stores and two packaged liquor stores at the time. And, uh, and uh, it was very much a, a, not only a close knit, knit immediate family. Uh, again, my dad was one of five siblings. The five families have 15 children, had 15 children. Uh, I'm one of those 15 first cousins, uh, the 15 of us. Uh, have, I think, 36 or 37 children. Uh, for many years, the youngest was my, uh, my, uh, my, our youngest daughter, uh, who's now 19. There's now a couple that are even younger than that. And uh, you go to the first night of Passover Seder, there's 100 people and 95 are related. And growing up, remember growing up in Atlanta, my, my grandmother, I never met my grandfather, he had passed. But my, my dad's mother was very much the matriarch of the family. I remember even as a teenager, uh, on Friday nights occasionally, when, irrespective of what you're going to do Friday night, go on a date, go out with friends to a ball game, whatever you're going to do, you, you and your friends were welcome to stop by our grandmother's house and there would, you could stay 10 minutes or three hours. And uh, I never appreciated it and certainly probably took for granted the closeness and the size of this large Sephardic family. And, uh, and that, of course, is extended to the Orbe Shalom. There are other large Sephardic families in Atlanta, like the Aragetis and the Meslias, and, and certainly many others that were not quite as big, but there are several that have lots of cousins and stuff. And, uh, and uh, you know, again, that's, that's a tradition, I think, that uh, that closeness of family. And then growing up in a small family business where, uh, you know, at age 10, my cousins and I were bagging groceries at the two grocery stores and, you know, stocking shelves as we grew up and cutting meat. And our summer vacations in some ways tended to be our, our dad's summer vacations a little bit because these were small grocery stores and we were helping manage the store. And uh, so I, I learned, I, I think I was fortunate in many ways. 
One, you know, if my dad was a doctor, I couldn't go work for him at the office necessarily. Uh, my dad had a small operating business and I was able to, to learn a work ethic, to have money in my pocket to go out on dates. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think learning a work ethic, learning how to take care of your customers and your employees. Uh, I saw that in, in, in a small way growing up in, in, in that small family business, helping out when an employee had an issue. Uh, uh, and this was not by no means a giant business, but it's, we certainly were, were blessed uh, uh, relative to, to, to the, all the employees. Uh, so I, I think when people ask me, what are the things that I brought to Costco? Uh, certainly I'm lucky I'm pretty good at numbers. Um, I, uh, I, learned, uh, I learned about customer service and uh, being uh, honest and transparent. And uh, you know, it, again, it fit with the culture that was here. Um, what I find, that notwithstanding the size of many of you on the call, to the extent that any of you before COVID worked in a, a big office, you know, there are, I've been in many a, a headquarters of companies where uh, you better not be smiling or you, if you're, the last thing you want to do if you're a junior employee is have the CEO walk by you while you're sitting talking in the hallway. Well, at Costco, it's the kind of environment that we're all working hard, but if the CEO happens to pass a couple of hourly accounts payable perks in the hallway, Rather than freaking out, uh, those two individuals they stop, they respond, they look at the CEO and say, "Hey Jim or Hey Craig, now did you see the football game yesterday?" And uh, I think it's a it's a health working in a, a healthy work environment. Um, while we're all working hard, it just makes life a, a lot better. And uh, so I I, I think uh, again uh, some of the the basic skills and things that I learned certainly got me this job. Uh, I might have been just that young man, Richard, that worked on this financing from New York if I didn't know anything, some of the, the silly retail terms, like I always joked that I knew shrink wasn't a, a doctor. It was inventory shortage. I, of course, know it's two things now. But at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, uh, all of us, all of you out there, you know, being fortunate enough to find a, a business that you enjoy or working with people that you enjoy makes life a lot easier. Certainly success helps too. I've seen a lot of successful companies where the people are not as happy. Um, and uh, so I think a, a lot of the things that our founders preached, and again, in terms of making employees feel safe and secure, uh, being transparent, uh, having an open door policy, as big as we are, any employee, I got a call two days ago for an hourly employee in our Lafayette, Louisiana warehouse. I'm not sure how she got my number uh, and I not necessarily could help her specifically, but the deal is, is, if you have a problem that you feel you're being treated unfairly or whatever it is, um, you, you need to go to your supervisor and you go to their supervisor and to the manager and to the regional person and all the way up to the CEO. Not that every solution answer is going to be this answer that that particular person wanted. But at the end of the day, we have an open door policy that works. We have an HR department that does follow up on things. Uh, we're not punitive that if somebody is doing something wrong. If it's illegal or something, goodbye. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we give you a say, it's okay to make a mistake. And uh, again, I think some of those basic cliches you find in business management 101 really is, are those things are exemplified here and they really do work. They take a little more time. I probably spend 5% of my work day, not each day, uh, dealing with employee issues that have come to me for something or some supervisor. And, uh, but having that open door policy, I think, uh, makes our employees feel that we actually do care. And, and um, again, that we're, that we're not going to always agree with their view on something. But at the end of the day, we, they, they owe an an, they're owed an answer, they're owed, owed an answer that, of why. Hey, I'm going to ask one other question, then open it up to the floor. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them to the chat box. I will try to get to as many as possible. I already see a couple of great questions, so, so keep an eye out for those. Um, we're curious if you can talk a little bit about maybe um, some Sephardic customs or maybe Latino words and phrases you remember growing up with or other kind of things and maybe foods even. I know, you know we always say food is most important in the Sephardic world, but maybe you can talk a little about kind of the, the, the home personal environment, some of the things you grew up with there. Well, we'll start with the, the food. I mean, barecas and biscochos and uh, those types of, of items. Um, um, on, on, the, on the Sephardic phases, phrases, you know, I remember as a kid, my dad, when my grandmother got mad about something or worried about something, 
she would start, she spoke wonderful, fluent English, but she would start, you know, expressing herself uh, in Ladino. And my dad and his siblings certainly all spoke, spoke Ladino. None of, to my knowledge, none of my generation of those 15 first cousins spoke Ladino around the house. So I wish you would ask me, uh, I, I had this question in advance. I'd come up with a few that I could, I can remember them, but I can't remember how to speak, speak it necessarily. So I really, uh, but I, I grew up, you know, certainly mostly in, in an American Jewish household, uh, but with a Sephardic, you know, catch to it in a big way. And, and it's less so today because, um, again, I, I attend the Neshkenazi synagogue. Uh, more of the kids are, you know, uh, you know, not all of my Sephardic friends married Sephardic friends and, and things like that. Great. No, I appreciate that. It's, it's also okay. I don't want to put you on the spot. Certainly not. Um, we got a couple of questions over here. I'm going to jump into the chat. Um, first question over here. Um, where do you see the future of retail compared to online shopping, particularly with the challenges of major competitors like Amazon, who have really expanded tremendously compared to, to kind of in-person stores, which in some of them have been struggling, not necessarily Costco, but others? Sure. I mean, first of all, I mean, the whole, the whole COVID pandemic has sped up delivery uh, by online and pick up in store uh, e-commerce. Um, you know, for our fiscal year ending in August of, 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 of uh, 2019, I think our e-commerce business was big, but only 5%, it was, it was about eight and a half billion dollars, which was only about five, five and a half percent of our 150 billion. Um, the first half of our fiscal year from August, from September through February, early March, uh, it was up about 20%, fine. In the second half of the fiscal year from, from you know, March to August, it was up 80 to 100%. And it's continuing on a year over year basis at those levels. So, um, you know, it's a business that's nearly doubling overnight in the course of a year. And that's excluding other forms of, of omni-channel distribution. You know, many of you probably have heard of a, a company called Instacart. Uh, we are one of their largest customers, if you will, or partners. Uh, they, they, they partner with many retailers uh, around the U.S. and to some extent Canada. Uh, they offer same-day uh, fresh delivery. And so you can go online to Costco.com. We use the, the, their, what's referred to as their white label engine uh, and, uh, or go directly to them. It's cheaper if you go to Costco.com actually. And, uh, and, uh, and there's several hundred items, including all the fresh items that you can order online and in many cases get it within a few hours, but certainly same day. We also, uh, that's a business that exploded uh, when the original lockdown occurred back in, uh, in April, May, uh, into March, April, and May, uh, up tenfold. And it's still up fivefold after that. Uh, so that's, you know, again, timing was good that we partnered them with them for a few years already. And that was pretty much in place. Uh, the other, uh, another aspect is uh, two-day dry grocery. We do, we do that ourselves through about 19 locations around the United States with about 700 of our items, which are mostly food and sun, not, for, not same day, it's two days, so it's not fresh foods, uh, are frozen, but it's uh, dry groceries, uh, sundries, you know, paper goods, cleaning supplies, uh, health and beauty aids. Uh, we also are uh, spread, expanding now to provide same day delivery of prescriptions through the Instacart model. So there's different things. So, you know, is everybody, in the future gonna shop online and never go out anywhere and never go into a store. Uh, God forbid, uh, not just for my health of our business because we'll figure it out. We have other channels now. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, the new normal, there's gonna be a few new normals probably over the next few years. Is there more online? Is our online doubled in one year instead of being up 20%? Yes. Uh, will it go increase the following year even more? Probably. Uh, five years hence, well, keep doing that? Probably not. But if it was 5% of our business being online and another few percent through those other omni channels, well, that's seven or eight, which this year will be, you know, 12 or 11 or whatever. Uh, will it get to 50? Probably not. But could it be 20, 25 over time? Yes. In terms of the those who have benefited and not, in a, in a fortunate way for Costco, but it's certainly an unfortunate way for our community and everybody out there is, is certainly the success of supermarkets, 
uh, Walmart and Costco, Amazon, of course, and the other big boxes, Target, and of course, Home Depot and Lowe's as well, and Best Buy. We've all benefited from the fact that one, people aren't eating out, so they got to buy their food elsewhere. Two, people were uh, starting this summer uh, when there was a little bit of COVID fatigue. Uh, you know, people were tired of being indoors, and but they were still at home. They weren't traveling. They weren't buying concert tickets. They weren't going out to restaurants. They weren't flying to Hawaii or the Bahamas or Mexico for vacation or Europe for vacation. Uh, they were spending money, though, and they were spending it on their home, whether it was outdoor furniture and lawn and garden items, whether it was indoor furniture or new mattresses, whether it was exercise equipment. If you go out and try to buy a hot tub today, there's a six or 12 month wait for it. Uh, not at Costco, and uh, we don't at Costco as well, but everywhere. Uh, so people were buying uh, gadgets for the uh, for the kitchen and uh, domestics. And so uh, we benefited from that too, since we have multiple categories. We've got you coming in because you're buying food and you're buying great value and quality, of course. Uh, but so life has changed a little bit. At the end of the day, when, when Wall Street asks us, you're doing so great right now, Costco or Target or Kroger or whoever, um, what happens when you know, there's a vaccine and there's no concern about COVID. Well, first of all, it's going to take some time. And, and secondly, and unfortunately, some businesses have gone out of business over this time. You can imagine a small independent furniture store or a small independent apparel store or some of the downturn that was already happening at the mall stores. Uh, some of that has maybe gone forever. Uh, and, and, and that market share has moved to bigger boxes in, in our, as well as our case and the Amazons in the world. Um, and some of it will go back. I, I look forward and hope to be able to go more often to restaurants and sit, you know, shoulder to shoulder in these places. At the end of the day, let's say, God willing, that will happen over the next two or three years over time. Um, some of that lost demand that they, the lost business they had is sticky with other, other forms of retail uh, or distribution. And so at the end of the day, uh, not that we would ever wish this on anybody, but this pandemic has clearly had uh, certain haves and have nots out there. Um, and Costco overall has benefited first and foremost because um, we're a big space, uh, you know, with lots of space, uh, physical location. We think we've required, we were the first big box retailer to require masks back on May 4th, uh, much to the chagrin of certain people to start with, but it seems that everybody has followed suit. Uh, I think people generally feel safer coming into a big box and then smaller size facilities. And so we benefited from several of those things, having more people come in uh, initially for food, but some of those other non-food categories, you know, that has more than offset some things that have gone down. We have a, a pretty big successful travel business, which is needless to say uh, alive, but it will take a lot of time to get back to where it was. Uh, for 20 weeks during the midst of the pandemic, we had our pharmacy, and not our pharmacy, our optical and hearing aid centers closed outright because of the direct contact before we could get the safety protocols in place from masks to plexiglass and the whole bit. Uh, our food courts, uh, we've greatly reduced the menu. We've taken all the seats and, and chairs out. Uh, you know, we've hurt that business substantially, but of course it's the right thing to do. So when you add it all up at Costco, uh, it's been a benefit, a net benefit to us. Uh, when you look at what's going to happen over time, there will be more online sales. There will be more pick up, buy online and pick up in store. Um, we like to think of ourselves, we still want you to come in, again, post-pandemic and everything even more so. Um, when you come in and walk around, you're going to buy more. And ultimately, we're merchants and we want to sell you more. And uh, so I think time will tell. And uh, I, 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 like many, like all of you, I assume, are, are hopeful that if a vaccine, in fact, does come in a short period, over a six to nine month period, it's available, that we'll be looking a year from now, uh, perhaps still wearing masks, but feeling a lot better about the future and things getting back to normal. Another question here, particularly from one of our supporting young professionals. Uh, what advice would you give to a young professional uh, wanting to enter in the multinational grocery retail industry? Well, um, call me, I guess. No. Um, look, at the end of the day, one of the challenges of any great company uh, for, in terms of considering to go to work for them or what are your opportunities over time? Um, if, if, if one was fortunate enough to start at Costco, not, I mean, I entered at a decent level too because I was coming 
from Wall Street and you know, help raise money for the company. Uh, but you know, uh, if, if I look back at the first few years, uh, you have senior executives here today that started literally pushing carts and stocking shelves part-time while they were going to college, never thinking about going into retail. But they liked the company and they stayed around. And, uh, and, uh, and so we've created a lot of opportunities. The speed at which those opportunities occur is less today in a company our size. Uh, not to say that it's, it's not attainable, but uh, certainly uh, working for smaller or medium-sized companies may get you where you want to go faster in some cases. Uh, I'm not trying to talk someone out of it, but the, the, other, the other challenge at a company like Costco is as wonderful as my mother says we are, uh, we're pretty good. And, uh, and we have very low employee turnover. Our turnover uh, is, at the office is less than, and even before COVID, is less than 6%, which is off the charts low. Our turnover, even in the warehouse, where half the employees are part-time hourly, and we have seasonal people come and go between October and Christmas, our turnover is 13% over the year, including seasonal hires, and, and they're just there particularly for the season. So at the end of the day, we pay well, we have great employee health benefits, uh, and we hopefully we, we are honest and fair uh, uh, with our employees. And so it's an environment that, aside from growing at a slower rate of growth each year, we're still doing very well, but growing at a slower rate than we did in the first 10 years, uh, we, there's not a lot of turnover here. So I, I think that's the challenge. In terms of figuring out what you wanna do, which is even made more difficult right now with COVID, um, I always tell, particularly like young people getting out of college, um, it's okay to have, to try a couple of things in the first three or four years. What you don't want is 10 years out to have 10 things on your resume. Uh, but at the same token, uh, your first job doesn't have to be your last job. Um, if you're lucky, like me, it might be. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, there's plenty of opportunities out there. Uh, some of the things I talk to people about, young people, I don't know what how, how young everyone is, but when they're they're considering a job in any type of corporate headquarters, and I'm assuming people will get back to head, to working in office, maybe not as much as before, but not entirely at home. Um, I would say if somebody was coming to a, our headquarters for an interview, get there half an hour early and see how employees greet their guests in the lobby. And if you get a chance to go to the lunchroom at lunchtime where all the employees are, uh, not that we're smiling and whistling while we work all the time, and you'll get a sense of, of a little bit about the environment of the, com uh, of the company. And again, I've, I've seen offices and I know people who have worked at companies where you better not be smiling or if you're in the, in the hallway, you better be on your way to a meeting. Uh, learn about the culture of the company, uh, not just what the company does. And certainly you wanna do something that you're interested in. And, and again, it's okay, it's okay to, to change jobs two or three times in the first five or so years of your career in my view. Uh, a fun question. Uh, any surprising perks uh, that you get working at Costco, like unlimited samples? I'm sorry, what was the question? I said any, uh, one fun question was any surprising perks working at Costco, like unlimited samples? You know, we have like, what's surprising about Costco is, is the, li the, the, the limit of perks. Um, I already shared with you that I got my parking space based on the, the day I started working at Costco, not on my position at Costco. I would have had the same good space either way, but nonetheless, it was that way. Um, uh, I, we don't get employee discounts. Uh, most retailers give their employees a big discount, but most retailers have a much higher markup. And we mark up our goods lower than anybody else. Um, we do get a free executive membership. Uh, so that's $120 a year and, uh, and no extra free samples. I guess I have one perk. Um, our kitchen downstairs, commercial kitchen, which tests all kinds of items that we ultimately offer in the warehouses from rotisserie chickens to the, the various, uh, uh, the various uh, take home and heat up meals. Um, a lot of those things were come up for our CEO to do a tasting. Well, I make sure I'm always invited. So I guess that's one perk that I have. The tasty perk for sure. Um, someone has an issue question oh. here. Oh, well, that last thing in terms of the lack of perks, um, at these times of year when the, the new Xbox just came out, the new PS5 came out, um, you can imagine the number of calls I get from friends and family saying, can you get me one? I can't get me one. Um, 
unless I go online and when a million people hit the site in 10 minutes for the 50,000 units we have, uh, I'm lucky enough to get one. And uh, I think, again, it keeps, it keeps us all on the same page. Uh, another interesting question here. Um, I've, someone has noticed that uh, she often sees Jewish, uh, Jewish oriented content, Jewish oriented products in Costco, which surprises her a bit because the Jewish population is very, relatively small compared to the general population. Is that much more based off of demand or is that some influence potentially from the top based off of what you've seen is needed in the Jewish community for certain products? Um, well, as we know, some of this Jewish food is really good. Uh, no, it, it's first of all, it's not based on anything from the top or the bottom, frankly. It's based on what sells. Um, if you go into you know, our New York locations in the Northeast, there's gonna be a lot more kosher foods and Jewish foods than there are in the Midwest uh, or in the Northwest, frankly, and unfortunately. The Northwest is Oregon and North, not the Bay Area. Um, you know, my wife can't get the, the, uh, the uh, whitefish salad because we don't sell it in our region. Uh, she'll have to bring it when she visits Atlanta or LA or something. Um, but, you know, it's the same thing, if you go into like our Manhattan location, um, there's a huge amount of kosher foods because there's a big uh, Orthodox community in, in uh, North Manhattan and Lower Bronx. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and right across the aisle is a huge amount of halal, uh, you know, hanging lambs, you know, lamb quarters, uh, hind legs and stuff uh, for the uh, Muslim community. So we're, we're agnostic. We're going to sell what sells, and uh, if it doesn't sell well, don't expect to see it at Costco for a long time. Now, there's an interesting question here about uh, the, the fact there are so many uh, major companies uh, based in Seattle, Costco, Microsoft, uh, Amazon, major corporations that have really influenced the market today. One, uh, is there a specific reason that you would think to accredit that? And two, um, do often you and other major company executive based in Seattle's ever meet, have roundtable discussions, or discuss some corporate interests based off your common location? Well, I, I think probably like many companies, they're headquartered here because their founder was here. Uh, George Weyerhaeuser started the timber company because he was from the Northwest here. Uh, Mr. Boeing was in Seattle uh, for Boeing. Um, uh, uh, one of the two founders of Costco was from Seattle that wanted to bring this new club concept, warehouse club concept to Seattle. Um, the Nordstrom family was from Seattle and it started with the first shoe store a hundred or so years ago. So generally speaking, that's why what's at Microsoft, of course, Bill Gates and, and Paul Allen both were born and raised here. So I think that probably has more to do with it than anything. They certainly, they certainly didn't come for the winter weather. Um, now, interesting, Amazon, uh, Jeff Bezos moved here in the, 96, 90, I think 1995, 96, uh, he wanted to use this new thing called the internet to sell an unlimited selection of books online. And he chose Seattle versus the Bay Area uh, for two reasons, uh, I'm told. One was is uh, there was a lot of tech talent here because of Microsoft. And if so it wasn't as expensive as the Bay Area. And two, the largest book distributor at the time in the country was a, 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 a thing was called Ingram Books out of headquartered in Portland. So the book, largest book distributor in the United States was just down the road. Uh, that probably has more to do it than anything to start with. Now, what that has caused is an explosion. There's a lot of tech companies here now. There's a lot of med tech, medical tech companies here. Uh, and so, you know, these have, uh, these have allowed other tech companies to grow here which is good if you bought a house 20 years ago, not as good if you're moving here. Now, I want to follow up um, just back to a question regarding um, some corporate management practices. Um, you know, often the question has come up, uh, I've seen it in the chat and other places, how do you develop kind of um, critical negotiating skills, particularly at that high of a level? And do you see a, a big difference when you're negotiating with a major, you know, potential partner retailer versus when you were, you know, but much on a lower ground with 50 people and negotiating uh, with a lower, smaller company or a property manager. Do you see a difference in, in skills and what kind of skills do you think you kind of formed from that? You know, I was always amazed early on when we were a relatively small merchant. And I, I, I of course, was not on the merchandising side, but I, I, I sat in on several meetings and I was always amazed when, particularly at the time, you know, many of the the brand name products you see on the non-food side today, none of those electronic suppliers and other 
you know, from Weber Grill, none of these guys would sell us. Certainly none of the branded apparel makers would sell deep discounters. And I was always amazed at our ability, once we could figure out a way to show them the types of volume per location we could sell and make life easier and got our hook at it, we were pretty good at that stuff. Um, I, I think the things that I've learned over time, whether you're a buyer is negotiating with, uh, with, a, with a merchant, uh, with, with, with a supplier, uh, or um, we're negotiating uh, uh, with a couple of other people, some people in my area, uh, a, a new major uh, you know, co-branded credit card program or a new banking relationship. Um, I think some of the points that Jim talked about in the very beginning of time here that you know, he, he had written down in words of one syllable, and this is before all the corporate scandals in the 80s and 90s and everything else, um, you know, obey the law, duh. Uh, but it's also, you know, be intellectually honest and exceed expectations. Take care of your customers uh, from great return policy to, you know, not taking one M&M out of the bag when chocolate prices went up. Uh, I'm not suggesting M&M did that, but, you know, in terms of, you know, being honest. Uh, uh, be, uh, take care of your, uh, your customers. Take care of your employees. Make them feel safe and secure. Be transparent with them and treat them well. Uh, as best you pay them as good a wage as you can uh, and uh, be tough but fair with your vendors if they're your partners and be transparent and uh, and uh, if you do that you'll reward the shareholders and I, I get back to negotiating skills when you're negotiating with your vendors your suppliers whether it's a, a merchandise supplier or a supplier of a credit card program with city and visa uh, or or a third-party bank uh, what we've learned is is understand as much as you can about all aspects of it. You know, if we're negotiating with a poultry plant uh, of Pilgrim's Pride or Purdue or, or, or Tyson or whoever it might be, understand as much as we can from the economics, from the feed costs to the manufacturing costs and labor costs and, 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 and go and understand, explain what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we want, we want to make a little a lot of times and we want them to understand that we both have to share that we and the supplier. And if we do it, we'll keep driving more business. And so in terms of being tough, I, I think it's, uh, I, I think most would agree who know me, I'm not an asshole, excuse my French. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, being tough but fair is the right way to look at it and, uh, and, and, and being transparent. And then in terms of negotiating skills, I probably, you know, I'm hoping I'm a solid B on it, not an A plus. Uh, but I've certainly learned from some A plus people. And uh, you know, again, the, the viewpoint that our our founder had was is negotiate a great deal, but don't negotiate a deal that it's going to create a problem in the future for the supplier. That when butter prices go up, they're going to have to take a little butter out of the butter cookie without telling us, or or something else. Or when there's something bad going on in the world, we're not the first. Uh, major corporate customer they're going to call back. I think we have a great reputation of being tough but fair. And, uh, and, uh, and I think that has served us well. And it's also served us well when there's been a, uh, when a supplier has had a problem. We want them to know that they can come to us and we're going to work it out with them. We're not just going to pay for their entire mistake, but we'll work with them. And I, I think we've shown over time, if, if, if you're open and honest with us, uh, and that's going to serve both of us well over, over, over time. And, uh, there have been times uh, when I've said to Jim, uh, we had, uh, in Mexico years ago, uh, we operated about 35 locations there. And at the time it was 50% owned by a major Mexico retailer and great family, uh, great company. And uh, they got in some own, their own financial issues with some of their other operations. And they had to sell this successful piece of their entire business called their half of Mex Costco Mexico back to us. We could have done that and taken it for a ride and, 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 and negotiated even harder and gotten a little better, uh, quite a bit better price. Our view was, is we going to be fair. And I remember saying to Jim, if, if a partner of ours ever gets in trouble with something, in trouble in terms of they have an issue on their side, not trouble if they did something bad, uh, but there's nobody better to be a partner with than us. And I think, again, that's, that goes back to the things as wonderful as I think I am in terms of being honest and forthright, I've learned a lot from a couple of the founders of this company in terms of taking that to an even higher level. And it serves you well over time. Can you speak a little bit to um, your 
experience in finance and in Wall Street, particularly um, what you experienced back in the 70s and 80s when you were still involved uh, on the street. And then today, kind of what is what do you think has changed in the past 40 years, both in terms of kind of, you know, personalities and kind of expectations of what a person has to produce really in the kind of financial financial services world? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the, the Dow was like at 780, not 29,000 or whatever. And, uh, you know, there was always going to be a scandal or a few. And uh, there was a, the, an oil family called the Hunt Brothers uh, that tried to corner the, the silver market and created, a, it went bankrupt, by the way, but it created, you know, great variations in the stock market. Uh, there, of course, was, uh, was in 1987, uh, Black Friday or Black Monday or something, uh, where the market crashed. Uh, there was certainly the late 08 when that crashed. So there's always going to be cycles of stuff. I think I think in terms of financial service and investment banking, you know, one of the challenges are there I think today today people have a much shorter term view. They're not looking to make a career at a company. In fact, God forbid they should be at the same company for more than uh, more than a few years. Um, I still posit that if you're lucky enough to find something you like with a group that you like doing it with, uh, the longer you're able to do it, uh, you'll be very happy. Um, everything has gotten more specialized on Wall Street. Um, you know, one, one thing I would say is, is when I first went there, I wanted to work for a big Wall Street firm, you know, Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or Kidder, uh, Dean Winter. Uh, and do big deals. And I ended up working for a more smaller boutique firm. And I look back and not only was that the avenue which got me here to Costco, but I got, to, instead of spending, you know, um, you know, multiple hours in the middle of the night proofreading debt documents for some giant company, I got to work with entrepreneurs of smaller companies. And, uh, and I think it was, in hindsight, it was more, uh, in retrospect, it was more rewarding. Um, there's a, again, there's a multitude of financial services. And they're not all in New York. Um, you can do those types of things all, all around the country or world. Um, it's not just traditional investment banking. There's all types of, you know, there's fin, what's referred to as fintech, all the companies that are doing something that's financial related, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, literally uh, warranties or rocket mortgage or, um, or uh, Robin Hood or Edge or you name it. So I think there's a lot of things out there. There's a lot more variations of things to do out there than there was, uh, you know, 35, 40 years ago. Um, one or two last questions before we start to wrap up. Um, first question, what would you say, um, it's actually a two part question. What was your proudest moment or what has been your proudest moment as the CFO of Costco? What do you think was probably the, the most challenging moment in your, in your career at Costco? Uh, gosh, I think, I think the proudest types of moments is when literally when we get great feedback about how, how good of a company we've been, whether it's literally an hourly employee who's retiring after 20 or 30 years and, and thanking us for providing them a good living wage and fantastic health benefits and being proud of being proud of the company they work for. And I can't, I'm, I'm certainly biased, but I can tell you that, uh, you know, if you're, if you're standing line in a movie, when you go to movies and somebody with an earshot heard the word Costco, they want to tell you their story, uh, mostly good. And so I, I think the proud moments are, uh, the reputation that we've gotten and, when you hear back from an employee from years ago, uh, uh, or somebody, some, some, you know, the many people that you've made a difference in their lives. Um, in terms of, uh, what was the last, the other question about negative? Yeah, what are the, probably the greatest challenges you've experienced? I think, probably the greatest challenges is, is dealing when there's conflict with an employee. Um, uh, one of the things I've learned over time is, is you have an employee come to you and they feel they've been 
they've been looked over in terms of a promotion. They always are, they always come in second. And then you talk to their supervisors and you look at their reviews and uh, they, their reviews were always better than the reality because their supervisor didn't want to be directly confrontative or objective. They don't have to be brutally honest, but you have to be honest. And I think I fall in that category as well. It's easier to not hurt somebody's feelings. And so over time, I think I've learned to be a little more direct. And uh, there are some difficult times uh, over the years where I wasn't as direct and it just took longer. It was more difficult to, to, to uh, accomplish uh, or to move that person along and, and help them improve because I, was, I wasn't as honest with them to begin with. It's not a good one. That's what I can think of off the top of my head. You know, again, I, I think back uh, in terms of Wall Street, in terms of our company being a public company, probably one of the most challenging things was there was, uh, we were going to miss our numbers. This is in the 90s. And our stock, let's say, was at 50. And, uh, and we were selling at a high multiple because we were a fast growing company. And uh, we were going to miss our numbers by a decent amount. And uh, there was a problem with the press release getting out. Uh, we would send it ourselves. Back then, you faxed, uh, blast faxed, if you will, instead of internet. Uh, and uh, maybe we had a list of 3,000 people that got it, institutional investors, money managers, whoever was on You know, My grandmother wanted to be on the list. She would be on it, whatever. And, and then, of course, it went out uh, with one of the world uh, press release organizations, uh, one of the national organizations that do that for a living. And... At that organization, person A thought person B did it, released it, person B thought person A did it, and neither of them did it. And so that morning when it was released, it was released only to those two or 3,000 people on our fax list. And that morning, our stock, it was a dis there were disappointing numbers. And our stock went from roughly 50 to 30 in a day or two days. And of course, aside from the SEC calling and wanting to know why this happened and did we do anything illegal, which we didn't. Um, the first order of business was to, that morning was get on the phone and run our conference call and explain, first of all, our, our, our release, what numbers, explain what happened. And uh, again, what I've learned over time, you deal with adversity head on, you're straightforward, you're honest, you, you, you don't overcommit. And, uh, and again, it's served us well over time, but I, that was probably one of the, toughest days when you're getting phone calls from unhappy shareholders telling you where to stick it and, uh, and, and worse. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, again, I've worked, I've been fortunate I've worked for a company where it's okay to make a mistake and uh, it's okay when somebody has made a mistake to figure out how to fix it and say, we screwed that up and we're gonna fix it. All right, with that, um, I think we're about wrapping up now. I want to take a moment and thank Richard so much for taking a time out from his really, of course, busy schedule, especially now with the pandemic. I'm sure it's been more than more than complicated enough, but I want to thank him so much for joining us. Thank you all as well so much for joining us. Um, if you're interested, again, in learning more about the Sephardic Brotherhood and all the work we do with the Sephardic Digital Academy, please go check out our website at sephardicbrotherhood.com. This is also a nonprofit initiative. We do rely on your support. If you're ever interested in making a donation or sponsoring a future class, please re reach out to us. You can email us at info at sephardicbrotherhood.org. One last thing, dot com, excuse me. One last thing, we'll be sending out a survey at the end of this class, an email survey, just to get one or two minutes of your time to take a look and let us know what you've thought of this series. This has been the first time we've done a Young Professionals uh, corporate series. So we'd really appreciate your feedback. Richard, again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you so sure. much for joining us. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you.